So um, what I'm going to try and do um, in the sh uh, hopefully in half an hour, <laughs> um, the um, the approach, um, the up at least what we currently use, um, our approach to patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. So the first few slides, I'm just going to highlight um, what you know. When do we treat this disease, and um, what what approaches do we take, and what is our ultimate goal in terms of what are we trying to achieve with these patients? Um, and I think it gets back to the same question we talked about: cure, or are we trying to control this disease long term? So when you talk about multiple myeloma, it's only a, one end of the spectrum of a this huge uh, number of patients with monoclonal gammopathies. And even this is just a representation of patients that have been seen at Mayo Clinic over a long period of time. And even then you can see that it's, um, it's, it's, it's only a small portion of the patients we see, only one-fifth have myeloma. The majority of the patients have monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And if you actually go out into the community, you can believe um, almost you know, over 90% of the patients with a monoclonal protein is going to be having a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. So it's very important we make an accurate determination of who needs therapy for their multiple myeloma. So I think it's important to uh, understand the concept of the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, who have small amount of plasma cells, no end organ damage, and these patients, we just continue to watch them without any intervention. Now, we know that all, all patients with multiple myeloma at some point in time have had mongers. And in a small proportion of patients, we do identify a transitional stage where patients go from the mongers to a smoldering multiple myeloma and then to symptomatic myeloma. Now, it's very important we uh, identify if somebody has a smoldering myeloma or a symptomatic multiple myeloma. The reason being, again, these patients are asymptomatic. They have no end organ damage from the disease itself. And the current standard of care is observation. However, that might change in the future as we try and develop um, safer therapies. We may start doing clinical trials, and we are already doing that with uh, lenalidomide to see if we can actually intervene early on and maybe actually avoid some of the problems that we see with the relapsed and refractory disease uh, with, uh, later on in the, uh, in the course of disease. So once you have um, a monoclonal protein, uh, these, are, these are the results of studies that Dr. Kyle has done over uh, decades. And if you look at patients with muggers, uh, it's only, um, it's about 2% of the patients over, uh, persons over 50 years and about 3% of those over 70 years of age. But when you look at the, the risk of progression to symptomatic disease, it's about 1% per year. Whereas if you look at the group of people who have small ring multiple myeloma, nearly half of them would relapse or progress within the first five years. But beyond the first five years, you can see that they pretty much parallel each other, suggesting that the smoldering multiple myeloma is really not a biologic entity. It's really a, 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 a clinical diagnosis, which basically have half of the patients who are true muggers and half of the patients who have myeloma, who just haven't yet become symptomatic. So uh, once you have diagnosed somebody with symptomatic disease, there are three things I think um, we need to do. One is obviously, um, as I talked about, the, the diagnosis itself and then the determination for therapy. Then the, the thing that has really changed uh, the, our approach to the treatment of this disease has been the ability to risk stratify these patients. And obviously, then we will talk about the different treatment approaches. Now, the diagnosis of myeloma obviously is based on uh, the classic criteria, such as the more than 10% uh, plasma cells in the bone marrow. Almost all patients would have some monoclonal protein in the serum and urine, and patients often have one or more of this endogen damage or the CRAP features, which typically includes a hypercalcemia, real insufficiency, anemia, and bone disease. Now, the way we, uh, we would... Um, detect the clonal plasma cells, obviously the most common way is to look in the bone marrow where we would see the clonal plasma cells. Sometimes patients may present with plasma cytomas where we can do biopsy and show that this consists of sheets of plasma cells. And more recently, we have increasingly been utilizing uh, flow cytometry uh, to detect um, plasma cells in the circulation. And this has become easier as the flow methods have become more sensitive. In terms of demonstrating the monoclonal protein, the traditional way have been to do a gel electrophoresis. And here's a normal uh, serum protein electrophoresis and an abnormal one showing the M spike uh, in the gamma globulin region. And then we can do an immunofixation and identify that the particular M protein is, in this case, is a G kappa. 
Um, more recently, we have been, been using the serum free light chain assay, which gives us the ability to measure the free kappa or the lambda light chains. And about 15% of patients will not have the serum or the urine protein electrophoresis showing a monoclonal protein. And if you actually incorporate the free light chain assay, we are left with maybe 2 or 3% of patients who do not have a measurable monoclonal protein. So the next step, once you have made the diagnosis, is the risk assessment. And there have been a variety of different uh, prognostic factors that have been identified over time. But I think the three most important things that we do nowadays, and I would say this is what's been used in the, in the previously, this is what is current, and this is probably where we are going for the future. And if you look at the ISS, very simple staging system that was developed uh, in the International Myeloma Working Group, um, uses just beta-2 microglobulin and serum albumin, and shows three groups of patients with very different survival outcomes and very simple to use in the clinic. But what has become more important in our evaluation of myeloma patients has been the appreciation that all these patients have cytogenetic abnormalities. Now, before we started doing fish testing, only about 30 to 40 percent of the patients could we detect a genetic abnormality by conventional metaphase cytogenetics. That's because the cells don't divide very well much. But once we started using FISH, we could identify an abnormality in 97% of these patients. And in about half of the patients, we would see translocations that involved the immunoglobulin heavy chain locus on chromosome 14. And also in about a little over 60% of the patients, we would actually see trisomies of multiple chromosomes. And these patients can subsequently develop also other abnormalities that include chromosome 13 abnormalities and p53 loss. Now, what is probably going to be in the future is maybe not necessarily the same platform, but different platform looking at the gene expression signatures. And there have been signatures that have been developed both by the Arkansas group as well as the IFM, uh, all of which are very powerful in determining uh, the poor outcome in about 15% about of the patients who have a rather poor outcome with the current therapies. So what we have been using has been what we call the MSMART classification, which is a risk-adapted approach to therapy of myeloma. Um, we initially started off classifying this group of patients as high risk um, based on the labeling index and the FISH uh, findings and anything uh, without those high risk factors were uh, standard risk. More recently, we split this into two groups, uh, categorizing this real high risk group, which is the 17P1416 and the 1420, or a high risk by GEP signature, which none of the therapies right now we think are able to change the prognosis of these patients. Now, we move the patients to the 414 or a deletion 13 by conventional cytogenetics or the high labeling index patient population to an intermediate risk because we know that this group of people can be treated with botosimab or lenalidomide based therapies and actually their risk or prognosis significantly improves. And the remaining patients stays a standard risk. So in general, the approach has been traditionally, the first question that we ask when you see a patient with newly diagnosed myeloma is, is this patient a transplant candidate or not? And I think it's still an important question, even though we don't have to make a decision as to whether this patient is going to transplant right in the beginning, we can um, think about doing that later on because most of the regimens that we use nowadays upfront are not myelotoxic and will allow us to collect stem cells. But if somebody is deemed to be not a transplant candidate at all, whether it's because of age or other comorbidities, we typically tend to treat them with a melphalan based regimens. And the tradition had been to treat them for a defined period of time, but more recently some of the trials have suggested that maybe maintenance options may also be beneficial for this group of people. Now in those patients who have a stem cell, uh, are candidates for a stem cell transplant, we give them an initial therapy and then we make a decision at this point whether we want to go to a stem cell transplant with or without maintenance or do we continue with the same treatment and use the transplant in a delayed fashion. Now, when we talk about the initial treatments of multiple myeloma, I think the, the things that you need to keep in mind, one is we need to rapidly control the disease because many of these patients may come in with renal failure, hypercalcemia, or other problems, um, and we want to reverse those disease-related complications. We do want to decrease the risk of early death. If you, even as late as um, 2003, 2004, when the, high, the LEN high-dose versus low-dose dex trials were being done, or the thalidomide versus dexamethasone trials, nearly 10% of those patients would die within the first year of diagnosis. Now with the novel therapy uh, regimens, the risk of dying within the first year of diagnosis is somewhere in the region of two to 3%. So clearly the novel therapies have changed the paradigm in terms of the early deaths. 
we want a regimen that is very well tolerated and we want to make sure that does not interfere with the ability to collect stem cells for stem cell transplantation. So what are, were the old tools? Um, more, almost all of us would be familiar with the, the dexamethasone based approaches including the VAD and the new approaches are the novel therapies uh, that you already heard about. Uh, the thalidomide, lenalidomide and the bortezomib and obviously there are new drugs that are coming in as well. Now when you look at the thalidomide and dexamethasone combinations and again this is just a collection of some of the several trials that have been done as well as retrospective reviews, what does stand out is that when you use thalidomide dexamethasone they do give us a much higher response rate but when these patients actually do get a stem cell transplant at the end of the transplant we really do not see much of a difference either in terms of the response rates or in terms of overall survival. Now when you, in contrast to that when you look at the other new therapies such as the bortezomib based injection regimen such as this IFM trial that Professor Haruso had done, you, look, you can see that the difference in the response rate um, with VAD versus what you would get with a bortezomib dexamethasone persists even after a stem cell transplant. So the difference is persistent, you see a progression free survival improvement though we have not yet seen an overall survival differences which probably is driven by the fact that most of these patients do eventually get that novel agent. Now it's similar story with lenalidomide and dexamethasone and this was the Southwest Oncology Group trial which looked at Lendex versus Dex as the first, the initial therapy and you can see there's a significant difference in the response rate and the progression free survival but again not much of a difference in the overall survival which again is not surprising given that all these patients did get the lenalidomide later on. Now, but the success of those two drug combinations led on to the development of multiple three and four drug combinations uh, such as the bortezomib thalidomide dex which you heard in the relapse setting, the bortezomib lenalidomide dex which has been very efficacious in the uh, upfront therapy, um, the cyclophosphamide combinations as well as the four drug combinations. And I would just highlight the two combinations I think are the most efficacious um, uh, at least um, in terms of what we have been using which is be the bortezomib lenalidomide dex and the cyclophosphamide bortezomib dex um, as we saw with the randomized phase three trial, phase two trials. So I think it's fair to summarize that you know over the past decade we have moved away from uh, dexamethasone based combinations which would give us about 10 percent very good partial response rate to two drug regimens such as lenalidomide and dexamethasone or bortezomib dexamethasone which would give us about a 40 percent very good partial response rate to the triple drug combinations which are giving us about a 60 to 60, 70 percent very good partial response rate. So clearly what we have achieved with this uh, three drug regimen is similar to what we would actually see if somebody were to get four cycles of VAD followed by a single autologous stem cell transplantation. So we have managed to substitute that particular um, block of therapy with a, uh, with a non-transplant based uh, therapy. Which brings us to the question as to uh, what role does stem cell transplant have today in, uh, in the treatment of myeloma and we'll come to that in a second. I just want to highlight some of the other lessons that we have learned with the use of these new drugs. One of them is uh, the, the impact of new therapies on high risk disease. Now um, before uh, the introduction of bortezomib, uh, we knew from the uh, experience uh, from different groups that patients with deletion 13 by conventional cytogenetics or people or patients with 414 translocation don't do very well uh, with the conventional therapies. Now this is the trial, the data from the EPICS data from Dr. Jagannath which showed that if in patients who are getting bortezomib versus persons who are getting dexamethasone, um, the, uh, their, if, if you were to get bort bortezomib, the, the, the patients will do much better, uh, the, the deletion 13 patients will do much better. Well, and this is the data from the IFM looking at the impact of 414 and again patients with 414 who actually got bortezomib dexamethasone did much better in terms of overall survival compared to VAD all suggesting that the, those two abnormalities or the impact of those two abnormalities can be overcome by use of bortezomib again justifying the movement of those categories into the intermediate risk category in the MSMART algorithm. Then the, the big question nowadays is should, do, we, do we still transplant these patients? If we can actually get to the same point that we could get to transplant by just using these uh, drug combinations, do we still need transplant? So let's take a look at wh what, what the data is in terms of the advantage of transplant. Now this is a meta-analysis of multiple trials that have, been, that have looked at high dose therapy versus standard dose therapy and you can see that uniformly um, all trials have shown an improvement in the progression free survival. 
However, when we look at the impact of the overall survival, the, it's the, not all studies actually favor uh, high dose therapy over standard dose therapy. Now, there are several explanations why those trials are showing different results. But one thing that clearly stands out is at the, 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 the end of the day, the most important question is if the patient ever got a stem cell transplant versus never got a stem cell transplant. So if you look at uh, the, the trials that have very little crossover, that means patients who got the standard dose therapy never got to a stem cell transplant, you can see there is a significant improvement in the overall survival. And this is further highlighted by the French trial, which specifically looked at the question, can we actually do, do we need to do an upfront stem cell transplant, or can we actually get away with doing a stem cell transplant later on when the disease relapses? And um, they are shown here, there was no difference in the overall survival, but the time without symptoms and toxicity of the therapy was much less um, if you actually um, uh, did a, a late high dose therapy. So there was a quality of life improvement uh, if you were to do a stem cell transplant early on. And that was the basis of most of us tending to do stem cell transplant early on in the course of the disease. Now that has changed in the past decade now with all the new, um, and so, so basically the, the reason for this approach, most of the patients going to early transplant was because of the quality of life. Now then, uh, then came the question, can we actually, um, with all these new therapies, can we actually improve upon the response rate by doing stem cell transplant? And the first, question, the first answer supporting the continued role of a stem cell transplant in patients with myeloma is just looking at the response rates. So even though we can get this very high response rate with these triple drug combinations, by giving them a stem cell transplant, we can further enhance the response rates in these patients or further deepen their responses. The second um, thing, again, there's an IFM trial that is specifically looking at the early versus delayed stem cell transplant in the context of novel therapies, but until those things become available, this is our own experience looking at an early versus delayed stem cell transplant in patients getting uh, IMID-based induction therapy. And what our own experience has been the same as what we saw with the French trial in the pre-novel agent era, that is an early stem cell transplant or collection early and transplant at the time of relapse, both have the same overall survival. Uh, keeping that as a, uh, as a viable option um, for patients who want to delay the stem cell transplant. So I think some of the, uh, the, the field has changed in terms of some of the reasons why we wanted to do an autotransplant early on. One of the reasons was, again, we didn't want to have patients to get prolonged alkylator exposure, but that is not an issue with novel agents. An another question was the quality of life, and we know that the novel agents are much better tolerated than the traditional chemotherapies, so there is nothing that stops us from continuing with the current therapy and doing a transplant later on. And there is also some suggestion that um, maybe a tandem transplant can be replaced by consolidation with a second um, or um, with novel agents. So, so I think with the paradigm still holds true, we can, with these novel agents, at least half of our patients would collect stem cells and continue on with the same therapy for a long time and uh, think about transplant as the second line of therapy, whereas half of the patients would go on to get transplant upfront and um, think about the novel agents as their first salvage therapy. So both approaches are equal. Now what about uh, maintenance therapy? Um, obviously this remains, to be, remains a very controversial area in myeloma today. Um, obviously, the, the early trials had looked at the role of interferon and steroid. There was some minimal or two or three month survival advantage when the Canadian trial used uh, interferon. Um, the, the more recently, the thalidomide has been looked at. This is the IFM 9902 trial, which looked at thalidomide maintenance post transplant and was able to show that there was an even free survival and also an overall survival difference. However, the subsequent analysis did not show the overall survival difference. Um, and moreover, I think the, the more important thing about the thalidomide trials have been that they have been associated with significant toxicity from neuropathy and very high rate of patient discontinuation. And more recently, uh, Keith Stewart presented the Canadian trial, which actually showed that patients on thalidomide maintenance had much poorer quality of life, all suggesting that maybe thalidomide is not exactly the best drug for maintenance strategy. So there were two large trials that were done looking at lenalidomide as a maintenance strategy, and this is the IFM trial that uh, uh, Michel Atal had presented uh, at the last ASH meeting. Again, showing that there's a significant improvement in the progression-free survival. However, we still have not seen any overall survival difference. And I think this is, the, this is the trial which really is going to give us the answer because there was no crossover in this particular trial. Compared to the US trial, which actually did the similar randomization, 
uh, but without um, um, without the consolidation that the IFM trial did. Uh, again, showing that there is uh, an improvement in the progression-free survival, and the most recent analysis suggests that there is some improvement in overall survival as well. However, uh, patients were crossed over in this particular trial, so it's really hard to interpret the results. Now, one of the concerns that have come up with these two maintenance trials have been the increased risk of second malignancies. And that is one of the reasons why we need to temper our enthusiasm for maintenance trial until I think the IFM trial matures and uh, gives us a survival advantage, if it will. Um, so uh, the, the obviously, you know, uh, botasimib is an active agent, so there has been attempts at looking at botasimib as a maintenance strategy, and this is the HOVON trial, which actually looked at uh, a VAD versus a PAD induction therapy followed by a botasimib based versus uh, a thalidomide maintenance strategy. And here they were able to show both an improvement in progression-free survival as well as an improvement in the overall survival. Now, one of the uh, criticisms, if you may, um, be, was that it's hard to dis, um, dissect out how much of the survival advantage is because of the maintenance versus actually this patient's getting a VAD versus PAD induction because most of the difference in the or the separation of the curves happened much early much before the maintenance actually was started um, in these patients. So it's quite possible that's just a reflection of the injection therapy efficacy. So our approach currently in patients with uh, newly diagnosed multiple myeloma who are transplant eligible, if they are standard risk, and these are 75% of the patients, uh, would get a four cycles of Lentex or uh, cyclophosphamide botasimib dexamethasone. We collect stem cells. And in our practice, about half of the patients would elect to continue with lenalidomide dexamethasone, and half of the patients would continue to go on to a stem cell transplant. And in most of the standard risk patients, we have not routinely adopted maintenance therapy because of the, all the controversy that has been associated with that. Now, what makes us decide uh, a patient goes to a transplant versus continue with the current therapy? It's often a mix of uh, patient choice, the type of toxicities they have had so far, uh, the type of response and so forth. Now, unlike in Europe, most of in, in US, most of the patients walk into your office already knowing what they want to do. So it's hard to randomize them or do any clinical trials where we would actually tell them, you know, randomize them between a transplant versus no transplant. So you know, a lot of patient choice actually plays into this decision making here. Now, if you have one of those 414 abnormalities or a high labeling index or a deletion 13, we would treat them with four cycles, so cyclophosphamide, velcade, dexamethasone a stem cell transplant, and a botasimib-based maintenance therapy for about a year. Again, based on some of the data from total therapy, uh, which suggests that at least a year's worth of treatment with botasimib is required to overcome that, uh, the bad effect of T414. Now, what if patients have really high risk, which is about 15% of patients? So it's about 15% here, about 10% here, and about 75% here. So uh, these patients, we have been, you know, none of the current therapies have been shown to keep this patient in patients in remission for more than two years, uh, including tandem transplant and maintenance therapies. We tend to treat them with uh, four cycles of a LEN um, botasimib combination, transplant them only if they are not in, already in a CR, and then continue them on progression uh, on maintenance till progression with uh, a botasimib based regimen. Now, what about the transplant ineligible population, which probably constitutes about um, you know, almost half of the patients that we see in the clinic, given the median um, time and age of diagnosis, about 67. Now, for the longest time, the melphalan and prednisone used to be the standard therapy for these patients, and with a median survival of about two and a half years. Now, keep this number in mind as we look at some of the curves later on. Now, one of the first uh, trials which really showed a benefit over melphalan and prednisone was the MPT trials, um, the first one being the IFM trial. And they also showed that the addition of thalidomide to uh, melphalan and prednisone significantly improved the response rate, improved the progression-free survival, and at least in two of these trials also improved the overall survival. Now, obviously, there are some differences in terms of the overall survival. Some of it may have been because of what kind of salvage therapies they got subsequently. But one of the disadvantages of the MPT has been the high rate of toxicity, especially the neurotoxicity, uh, as well as uh, the risk with embolism, as well as cardiac toxicity. Now, um, the VISTA trial uh, looked at the combination of botasimib with melphalan and prednisone. And um, Professor San Miguel uh, presented this study uh, showing that uh, if you um, combine, um, sorry, 
Um, bortezomib with uh, melphalan and prednisone, this results in an improvement in the progression-free survival as well as an overall survival. Again, suggesting that the combination of bortezomib uh, with melphalan and prednisone is an effective regimen. Now, more recently, we have seen the results of the trial looking at the uh, melphalan prednisone versus melphalan prednisone revlimid, uh, either given for a short duration or revlimid continued as maintenance therapy. And uh, the data so far shows that there is an improvement in the progression-free survival with maintenance revlimid, but no difference in the overall survival yet. And there has again been concerns with this regimen in terms of second malignancies. So in our practice, we have not been using MPR as a therapy. But our approach has been either melphalan prednisone bortezomib or melphalan prednisone um, uh, thalidomide or just lenalidomide or dexamethasone combination. So um, again, just to summarize our approach, standard risk, it's a lenalidomide dexamethasone or um, uh, MPT or MPV. Um, in intermediate risk, specifically, we use bortezomib-based combinations with uh, followed by bortezomib maintenance. And in the high-risk population, we tend to go back to the bortezomib lenalidomide dexamethasone. Now, um, the last few slides, I just want to highlight the importance of supportive care in this disease. Clearly, we have made great strides in coming up with new therapies with very high response rates and long progression-free survival. But still, a majority of the patients at the time of diagnosis have several other issues. The most important being, obviously, real insufficiency, the bone pain uh, because of fractures, uh, often patients present with neurological compromise because of the uh, vertebral compression fractures, hypercalcemia, and infections. And uh, if you look at the renal failure, this is again our experience based on about 1,500 patients seen over 10 years. Uh, about half of the patients will have a normal renal function. About a, a third of the patients will be in between a 30 to 60 uh, creatinine clearance, and almost 13% will have uh, creatinine clearance less than 30 ml per minute. Now, obviously, this is multifactorial. The majority of the patients have cast nephropathy or hypercalcemia, and that can be rapidly reversed by effective therapy. Uh, but in someone who presents with, uh, without any, any high levels of light chain or hypercalcemia and real insufficiency, always keep in the back of your mind that this person may actually have light chain deposition disease or underlying amyloidosis. And this often, uh, these patients do not improve right away and can take a while. Now, in terms of management, uh, it's, so it's very important to identify the cause of renal failure. Uh, so in majority of the patients who present with renal failure in myeloma, we try to do a renal biopsy to distinguish between cast nephropathy versus some other changes. Um, the supportive care is important, treating the hypercalcemia and the dehydration, avoiding the nephrotoxic drugs. We have still been using plasma exchange in selected patients, especially patients who have light chain levels over 100 milligrams per deciliter. Now, granted, the randomized trial, um, the Canadian trial, did not show any advantage, but that was before the time when we could actually select um, patients with very high light chain levels. And I think um, all of us um, would like to start these patients on a uh, bortezomib-based therapy. Um, I personally always favor using either a bortezomib doxyl dex or a bortezomib thalidomide dex in patients who present with uh, renal failure due to cast nephropathy. Now, bone disease, again, nearly two-thirds of the patients will have some degree of bone disease, commonly lytic lesions and fractures. Um, and um, the, um, it's very important that we address this issue. Um, now, for the longest time, we all were using bisphosphonates, and we were using it because we wanted to avoid the, uh, the bone uh, disease related to myeloma. Now, the MRC-29 uh, trial actually did show that uh, patients who were getting bisphosphonates so in this particular trial, solidronic acid versus chlorodronic acid, there was actually an improvement in the overall survival of these patients by about five months, suggesting that the bisphosphonates may have uh, more effect in myeloma than just the uh, bone preserving or bone um, strengthening effect. So I think uh, the current guidelines, at least our approach has been that all patients should receive bisphosphonates irrespective of whether they have lytic bone disease or not, based on the MRC trial. Uh, we have been favoring mostly pamitronate because of some concerns with uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw, but I think both of them are efficacious. Celadronic is more efficacious uh, in terms of actual potency, but um, concerns of osteonecrosis of the jaw. Nobody really knows what the ideal duration of therapy is, um, since given that these agents do deposit in bone and stay there for decades, uh, most of us feel that 18 to 24 months of therapy is adequate, and then we can stop uh, or at least give them less frequently depending upon the disease uh, status. And uh, obviously, it's very important um, that all these patients have a dental evaluation before we start bisphosphonates in order to avoid uh, the risk of having to have a procedure later on and increase the risk of uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw.
So again, uh, the third thing I just want to highlight is the importance of infectious uh, disease prophylaxis. I think uh, we don't necessarily always use antibiotic prophylaxis in these patients, but I think patients with history of infections at the time of presentations certainly should be considered for either um, a quinolone or um, uh, Bactrim prophylaxis. Um, there is probably some role for immunoglobulin IVIG therapy in a selected group of patients with significant hypogamma globulinemia who gets frequent infections. Um, anti zoster prophylaxis is particularly relevant uh, with uh, acyclovir in patients who are getting botosomy based therapies. And most of us tend to get these patients vaccinated with the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccination, vaccine uh, at the time of um, diagnosis. So I just want to conclude with a couple slides showing how are we still making progress. Now this is, um, these are basically the patients we have seen over the past 10 years divided by every two years. And as you can see, these are the patients who were seen in between 99 to 2000. These are the patients who were seen in uh, three two-year periods in between. And these patients were seen in the last, you know, in 2007 to 2009. And you can see that we are still continuing to make uh, improvements uh, in the outcome of these patients. And this is particularly highlighted uh, by uh, this slide. Again, I just want to show you that there were 75% of these patients alive at three years. And compare this to the median survival we saw <coughs> in the meta-analysis trial, which showed that the median overall survival was two and a half years. Now, this is a group of 330 patients who received lenalidomide dexamethasone-based induction therapy. And the red, red line on the top are patients who are less than 65 years of age, whom we would typically consider to be transplant eligible. And it, I think, you know, it's impressive that we have 75% of these patients still alive at five years. And even if you look at the older group of patients, still 61% of these patients are still alive at five years, uh, which is significantly almost twice um, as long as what we have seen with the MP era. So clearly we are making uh, great progress, but obviously much more work needs to be done because these patients all eventually relapse and we need to find new drugs uh, to continue with the disease control. And I would stop there. Thanks.